Disorders of sexual development have often been considered as a medical and a social emergency. But what's been often ignored that it is actually an emergency for the doctors who rush towards going to the books to the various things as to how to evaluate an individual with DSD. IDSD will focus on the entire aspects of the sorrow sexual differentiation ranging from pathophysiology to classification to evaluation and management to IDSD which is going to focus about disorders of sexual de development which is a very intriguing topic a very interesting topic which is often causing a lot of confusion with regards to evaluation and management website learning.growsociety.in which from which we are webcasting this event where we have got multiple options available for learning in the form of our master pediatric endocrine course over 18 months covering nearly now 100 modules on everything related to pediatric endocrinology so if you want to learn you've got each and every aspect which is there using videos using text pre-test case scenarios and everything available we have recently launched a pediatric endocrinology for postgraduate program which again is covering a number of learning modules specifically for postgraduates for a three-year period all of you can have a look at a book which is available and along with that there we have the mobile application basically which is covering in that perspective the various aspects of management of pediatric endocrine disorders including the approach pathway the management pathway the personalized management care and there are various ways you can use it's a very intuitive form in terms of evaluating patients with different disorders of pediatric endocrinology and these are available on Android and iOS. Uh, today's presentation, I will be presenting about the various gonadal malignancies in the disorders of sexual differentiation. I have divided my presentation into the introduction, pathophysiology, risk factors, etiology, management, and follow-up of these patients. Now, beginning with the introduction. So why are we discussing this? Gonadal tumors comprise an important clinical problems in the individuals with these disorders of sexual development. Uh, Conventionally, it was considered that all 46 XY DSDs who have a gonad have to be removed. But now this is slowly move, moving towards a more holistic approach where we consider uh, the testicular function, the psychosocial aspects and various other aspects and take a final decision rather than just doing a blanket therapy. We have to appreciate that there is a lack of safe and well accepted guidelines where these gonadectomies and the timing of these gonadal surgeries come into picture. But scattered reports and various surveys and various reviews have been done from which I've taken my information from. So beginning with the pathophysiology, I think this has been very well discussed previously. So the germ cell development is a highly complex process requiring alignment spatially, temporally and genetically. So it all begins with the specification where the ordinary various other cells, they form the primordial germ cells. These are different from other types of cells. They are highly pluripotent cells. And then another influence of various factors, they then migrate from the epiblast to the genital ridge. This is mostly derived by the kit and the kit ligands. Now, even during this migration, they may stray off to other parts of the uh, other parts of the body. And if they are active over there, they might lead to formation of germinomas. But apart from that, when they reach the gonadal ridge, they are still not mature cells, and they are therefore called gonocytes or ugonia, which are the precursor cells. Following this, there is the sex determination, and in the presence of SRY, SOX9, or NR581, they form the testis. And in the presence of beta catenin or FOX cell 2 or RSPO1, they form the ovary. Now, coming to the most important part, the gonadal tumors. These gonadal tumors can be uh, classified as seminomatous or, or non seminomatous tumors. Seminomatous tumors contain neoplastic cells which are arranged similar to gonocytes, which I had mentioned in the previous slides. So, if these tumors arise from the ovaries of the dysgenetic gonads, these are called dysgerminomas. The same tumor, if it arises from the testis, is known as a seminoma. As, as I had mentioned, if they stray off to other parts of the body in extragonadal locations, these are called germinomas. Non seminomatous tumors include teratoma, yolk sac tumors, choriocarcinoma, and embryonal carcinoma, but we will be focusing more on the seminomatous as they were higher incidence in these uh, gonadal tumors. Now, apart from this, what is the gonadoblastoma, which we most frequently discuss, or germ cell tumor in situ? So, gonadoblastoma is nothing but a precursor to all the neoplastic or the malignant tumors. Uh, it is now hypothesized that it has a fetal defect. So, it is probably present when the infant is born, and it increases in size when the age increases. 
and histologically it contains all the germ cells so it has a germ cell lineage it has sex cord cell lineage similar to the sertoli cells or granulosa cells and cell nest similar to the leydig cells now very importantly these are not malignant these are benign tumors and they do not metastasize but few scattered studies like one study mentioned that all gonadoblastomas has a 50% chance of developing into a neoplastic tumor and all gcnis now i want to uh, uh, tell you that gonadoblastoma and gcnis are almost the same gonadoblastoma occurs in the uh, in the dysgenetic uh, gonad or the ovary and the gcnis and uh, occurs in the testes that's it so but the gcnis has a 100% chance of becoming into a malignant tumor but gonadoblastoma has a far lesser chance to becoming neoplastic a very peculiar concept over here is although some of them may occur bilaterally but most commonly these are found on the right side now coming to the dish germinoma this dish germinoma is a far more sinister pathology these arise from the ovaries or dysgenetic gonads and add, as i had mentioned if they combine from the testes they are known as seminomas similar to the gonadoblastoma they do have germ cells but what separates them from the gonadoblastoma is the presence of t lymphocyte infiltration and isocaryosis and high mitotic rate which increases the malignancy and hence they are malignant they are highly malignant and they spread to lymphatic spread and bony mats and 90% of them are unilateral now what about the non seminomatous tumors yolk sac tumors or endodermal sinus tumors these are highly malignant do alpha fetoprotein as a marker and these can be found in dysgenetic gonads struma ovary a very interesting concept these two tumors have thyroid producing cells and can be a cause of thyrotoxicosis in individuals and embryonal carcinomas from can cause precocious puberty now coming to risk factors the most important risk factor for all these tumors is the presence of a y chromosome the gonadoblastoma y region of the gby region which encodes the tspy the testicular <coughs> specific protein y encoded this is a very high and potent risk factor for formation of these germ cell tumors the uh, the formation of these germ cell tumors is proportional to the amount of mosaicism and also to the presence of masculinization so the more the masculinization more the risk factors as this is mentioned before higher the lo location of the gonad more the risk of uh, the tumor so abdominal more than inguinal more than scrotal androgen receptor high androgen levels as well as potent androgen receptors had a high risk of uh, these tumors as we can see in cis even though there are very high levels of androgen levels but the androgen receptor is not working so the per se risk of gonadoblastoma in them is very less and other genetic factors this pou 5f1 which is a marker for pluripotency present in the germ cells and other genetic factors such as wnt rspo and etc can be uh, use in markers or risk factors for these tumors now i've combined etiology and management together so let's go by one and uh, one uh, etiology one by one coming to first the pure gonadal dysgenesis uh, these occur due to under formation of the gonadal structure either you have a defective migration or you have impaired organization of the gonadal ridge or structural numerical chromosomal abnormalities like kleinfelters or turners complete gonadal dysgenesis you will for example uh, the swear syndrome which is xy complete dysgenesis complete female or a partial gonadal dysgenesis where the clinical features depend on the testicular function ability uh, the high risk of tumor genesis can be predicted by the presence of a y chromosome and the location of the gonads so when we come to a partial gonadal dysgenesis if it's a male phenotype we can observe the patient and we have a low threshold for gonadectomy if the testis is non scrotal if there is ambiguous genitalia and reduced testicular function if we have partial gonadal dysgenesis male with a fibrotic or streak gonad it is better to do an early gonadectomy however if the same male has a dysgenetic gonad so it is better to do an orchidopexy but our job doesn't end there orchidopexy merely brings down the tumor risk mildly and that that tumor gonad still has a risk of gonad uh, gonadal tumor so we need to observe that uh, gonad and in complete gonadal dysgenesis we are rare as female it is better to do an early bilateral gonadectomy because there is high risk of virilization as well and the high risk of gonadoblastoma in abdominal gonads coming to mixed gonadal dysgenesis there is a 20 to 25% tumor risk so in females who are rare as females better do an early gonadectomy to rule out risk of virilization streak gonads or fibrotic gonads do a gonadectomy 
same as previous male dis- but dysgenetic gonad better to bring it down now one important factor in mixed gonadal dysgenesis is the presence of ambiguous genitalia and if it's an infant we cannot take hasty steps here and it is better to wait and watch till the child develops a gender identity and then taking a further call the come to turner syndrome we know that the presence of y chromosome increases the tumor risk about 33% and it has also been seen that even if we have a negative uh, xy in the prens of karyotype uh, pcr can show 5 to 10% risk uh, 5 to 10% y chromosome in those who are karyotype negative for y hence so if you have a turner syndrome with y chromosome do a prophylactic gonadectomy but if you have a marker chromosome now various authorities are split on this condition some say you do a early gonadectomy some say you wait and watch so what is preferred here do a gonadectomy and do oocyte preservation but be on a lookout for y material and vitalization which is high risk and you should do it immediately at that time now coming to the various insensitivity syndromes beginning with the complete androgen insensitivity syndrome as i explained earlier the tumor risk is very low around pointed to 2% in prepubertal individuals and 30% in adult individuals now there are various advantages of actually retaining the gonads such as improved adult height and higher bone mineral density so in cis it is uh, it is suggested that in childhood you look at the gonadal location if it is abdominal inguinal per se does not require any management and management is only required if it is causing any mechanical form, uh, abnormalities in adolescence or adulthood it is very important to explain the par- patients the pros and cons of gonadectomy so the pros include there is per se we don't have any proper surveillance technique to rule out any gcnis and there is a risk of 10 to 15% but on the other hand there is a risk of progression from gcns gc is very low and if we remove the gonad there is a risk of high dependence and lifelong dependence on hrt so after explaining this if we if the individual opts for surveillance you tell him or the individual or the individual to advise monthly self examination of the gonads and we can also use various markers and if the individual opts for gonadectomy go ahead with it when it comes to partial androgen insensitive insensitivity syndrome the tumor risk is high and especially in non scrotal gonads as discussed earlier it is 50% high in non scrotal gonads so in these cases if it's a childhood uh, pub- childhood uh, problem in partial pais we have to explain to the child and we have to explain to the parents what to about the condition now if it's a male and if there's non scrotal testis you do an orchidopexy as early as possible and follow up this uh, testis do the markers advice monthly uh, evaluation if it's a female abdominal inguinal or lingual gonads no action needed unless and until there is any mechanical problems and if in this individual you see virilization happening it is an indi- indi- indication for uh, gonadectomy when when we come to adulthood it is very clear you have to have to explain to the, pa- the patients about the female or the male and based on their call they whether surveillance or gonadectomy has to be done the pros and cons as, as i had explained earlier can be done, explained to the individuals now one important factor here is that 1820 we can consider a gonadal biopsy for the detection of gcns rest everything is the same as cais the testosterone biosynthetic defects as explained earlier do have a risk but they are relatively lesser than all the gonadal dysgenesis and the ais the the smith lemley opits according to whatever reviews i had read only two reported cases are there and only query coincidental a cas such as a star scc they have a low risk of gonadal tumor less than 5% now 17 beta hsd has a almost 30% risk of gct so if there are phenotypic males you do close monitoring as i had explained they are not free from the tumor risk so you need to keep monitoring if it's a female you have to do gonadectomy to prevent further virilization now phi alpha reductase phenotypic males do an orchidopexy females do gonadectomy to prevent virilization 17 alpha hydroxylase 17 lyase per se has very limited data and there is no clear evidence to do any gonadectomy so summarizing what i have just told right now the individuals at high risk for tumor risk include first of all the gonadal dysgenesis with an intra abdominal gonad fraser syndrome dennis drash pais now if you notice here the high risk ones are the one who have an intra abdominal gonads and the same individuals with the scrotal gonads come down in the risk of uh, tumor genesis hence in those individuals it is better to do gonadectomy in the intermediate risk you can monitor and there is almost five alpha reductase as mentioned there is almost less to no risk of gonadectomy so you can uh, be status quo 
Now coming to the follow up of these individuals, how do we do this? Self examination, boys with DSD and scrotal testes need to be shown how to do monthly evaluation of the scrotus. So any change in consistency, size, shape, or any feeling feeling of any bumps or lumps, come to the doctor immediately. Imaging ultrasound is a very important tool in scrotal and inguinal gonads. It is important in annual follow up. The presence of microlithiasis is a very sensitive tool to look for any uh, tumorigenesis, but it's not very specific. MRI can be used in pre-op planning to locate intraabdominal gonads, but unfortunately, none of these techniques are recommended for monitoring the dysgenetic intraabdominal gonad. Now comes the role of the biopsy. So it has its advantages and limitations. The advantages include early diagnosis and monitoring of tumor development. But however, the limitations are far more that the gonadal tumors may be missed on biopsy. Initial normal lesions might be on further biopsy might be come to a positive as a pre-malignant lesions. There are no prospective studies and there is very limited evidence for the usefulness in female or ambiguous genital types. So per se, the gonadal biopsy is still a question mark to be done or when to be done. So the basic take home messages include prophylactic gonadotomy is still a matter of debate. Management is not just a blanket 46 sex by duo gonadotomy. You have to take in various multiple factors. And most importantly, the patient should be fully informed and involved in the decision-making process before doing anything. 